That everybody quieted down just perfectly right on time. That's if that's ever happened. <laughs> that's not an introduction. My experience. Um, so I will take advantage of that pause in the conversation to uh, introduce my former advisor, actually Graham Stevens. I was just mentioning to John. This is the first time I've actually had the <laughs> privilege of introducing Graham. Um, so I, I met Graham back in I think it was 1997. Started at Colorado State University. Um, I do remember, I'll tell just a little story and then I'll give you a little bit about um, where Graham is now, but um, I do remember my first meeting with Graham, and in fact I think, I think I still have notes from that meeting today, um, but how overwhelmed I was as a, I was a physics student, I just finished my master's degree in Canada, came to Colorado State University to begin uh, studying atmospheric science, and the number, the sheer number of ideas, I swear probably within about a half an hour meeting, I got about 30 ideas just sort of fire hosed at me while I was sitting there in his office. Um, and you know, some of them clearly stuck. I'm probably still trying to finish some of those today. So just as a warning to some of you um, students out there, um, you, you, your connection to your advisor never really sort of dies off. And I actually now view Graham as a colleague and it's uh, great. I was at JPL just a couple of weeks ago, um, visited with him and um, I think it's really nice if you can maintain that um, relationship with your advisor longer term. But um, So Graham was at Colorado State University uh, for over 30 years, about 35 years as a member of the faculty there. Um, as I said, I was a student um, in, in the late 90s and early uh, 2000s. Shortly after that, uh, the satellite that you've heard quite a bit about and that's uh, sort of depicted here in uh, one of Graham's paintings, um, CloudSat launched and so uh, Graham's been the PI of the CloudSat mission ever since for 13 years. Um, in 2009, was it that you went, to, or 2010? 2010, um, Graham uh, moved on to JPL, uh, where he currently is um, as the director of the, I don't want to get it, the Center for Climate, Climate Sciences at JPL, um, which was, I think, a new branch started at the time uh, that Graham got there. And so he's continued his work here using satellite observations to study the climate. Um, and like I said, the other thing I wanted to point out, he's also a very um, avid painter and has numerous paintings. If you ever go visit Colorado State University, this um, painting and several others are up on the walls of the uh, buildings over there and they're, they're elsewhere um, as well in different labs around the country. So today um, we're going to hear uh, a topic that's obviously near and dear to Graham's heart, cloud physics from space. Um, and this is a modified version of the lecture that he gave when he won the Mason Gold Medal from the Royal Meteorological Society, among many other awards that he's won uh, in recent years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so um, as, oh, it is on. Um, so as Tristan mentioned, this is from, um, uh, kind of adapted from the lecture I, had, I gave as the recipient of this award. And, you know, I was in London when last year, actually, when the award was given. And I had to give a seminar on this gold medal lecture, right? And I happened to, the night before, have dinner with my niece and her partner, who were working in London for about three or four years. And they wanted to know, why, what, what was the award? And I was a loose and didn't say that much. You know, just an award for the Lord and that So they went online to check. And they said, well, you're going to give a talk on cloud, clouds, physics from space. How can you talk about that for an hour? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, you know, it's sort of easy. You know. <laughs> so, you know, um, so I'm going to talk about this. It's kind of a little bit of a long lecture, but it's um, probably 40 minutes long. So it um, has quite a bit of material, but it's kind of not deep dive. It's a little bit sort of... Sort of a scan across the field of cloud physics. And so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start with a primer of weather modification. And we'll see why I want to start with weather modification. I'm going to then talk a little bit about the influence of three giants of our field that definitely influenced the media in place. And you can, you can recognize the middle guy because he pitches up in the department head um, office. Um, I talk some, somewhat about the Cloud, uh, cloud, cloud, cloud forces and feedbacks, that whole air, that whole science that sort of developed in the 70s in a very, in a very nascent way into the 80s more than into the 90s. And it really brought cloud physics presented on the global scale. Uh, became a really globally important problem, not just so much cloud scale, but really on the global scale. So, so it sort of 
changed the dimension of cloud physics in some ways. I uh, talk about the space board uh, aspects are going to sort of tie, tie this most of the warm clouds um, just because of the limit of the focus. You have to limit the focus on something as grandiose as this. So I'm going to talk about this from the point of view of warm clouds, which is quite relevant when you start thinking about cloud feedback from space. And then um, we'll have a little bit about what we're beginning to learn from the golden era. Uh, come back to come, sort of close science, science discussion on the aerosol indirect problem, and you'll see why I begin from the weather model point of view, if you see the cloud aerosol indirect problem is really very much runs parallel with the um, cloud indirect problem, the indirect problem runs parallel with, with the, with the um, uh, weather mod. And, uh, and, and the lessons learned from weather mod is lessons we're still remembering and we're learning today. And then um, the future, the future holds. Okay, so weather mod, let's start with weather, mod, weather modification of the primer. Um, general and ethics experiments were kicked off just post-war in about 19... 47 with Schaefer breathing life into a cloud chamber where they were able to produce snow and, and uh, precipitation. And I've only got one of the one of the observers um, at the same time sort of discovered silver iodine was a kind of a way of accelerating the process of precipitation formation in clouds. And this really gave birth to the modern 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 era weather modification. If you ever read the book of Fleming's that I just sort of flashed up in before, he talks about the history of how far back it goes, how far weather modification goes back even in the 1800s. Um, but the modern era really began there, and it's quite interesting because this era also kicked off cloud physics as a whole, as we understand for that, which I'll mention in a minute, with um, Mason. Okay, so in 2003, um, the Academy of Sciences did a report on weather modification. What, what, you know, how real is it? You know, how how credible is it? And so on. And sort of the bottom line message from all of the weather mod industry that happened over 40 some uh, well, since the, since these experiments of Schaefer in 1947 was that the results are basically, from a scientific perspective, overwhelmingly inconclusive. In part because the link between cause and effect could not be established with a handful of small number of experiments. You go and seed a cloud and precipitation changes, you could not establish cause and effect with just such a small statistical sample. Um, and so this, is, this is, was a major, major issue, major challenge, and this really gave birth, it was recognized in the, you know, in the 60s, and this gave birth to the modern numerical modeling of clouds. Right? Because in the models you could establish cause and effect, and that was the way that we could see that we could identify this. And so, really, a, a kind of really pertinent, I'm going to use this wacko pointer. I notice it's um, a badger pointer. It's pretty as not. You could interpret it a different way, I suppose. Um, and, uh, study of Simpson and Wigger, which probably is, you know, what I find today is that the younger researchers today, anything that's not published, anything that's not published in the last five years is not worth mentioning. Well, this is actually one of the important studies. Since when we were 1969, it was one of the really first cloud, uh, numerical cloud modeling experiments. Um, and basically, I'll read these words, because I know you the back you can't see this, but could, it's, it's words straight out of their paper, could a maritime cloud be inhibited from raining by addition of very, very small hygroscopic particles? More importantly, could the continental cloud made a lot of small particles, be caused to rain more by broadening its cloud-based spectrum. Right? This is the base, that was a sort of a second question, but the basic question of um, cloud seeding and precipitation production. But the first question is the aerosol, second aerosol windbreak problem. In fact, this experiment that they conducted was really the first study of the second indirect effect, at least that I can find. And so this is a, their figure, and I just sort of, and that's kind of a little fuzzy there, I suppose you can't really see the but this panel here is all you need to worry about. It's basically the solid curve represents the unperturbed cloud in their numerical experiment. They basically base this on uh, clouds they observe with aircraft and they set the parameters of the, of the model and they observe the cloud uh, and then model the, model the this is the reflectivity profile. And the perturbed cloud where they add lots of small particles to increase the number concentration is this profile here, the dash, so you can see a significant reduction in the reflectivity characteristics, which implies a significant reduction in precipitation and, and so on, right? So this is 
kind of an important experiment because really the main conclusion that they quote is a conclusion that really is relevant to the aerosol indirect problem today. One of the most important conclusions was that the main effect of seeding supercool tropical cumuli is through the alteration of the cloud dynamics which in turn alters the water carried and precipitated. That's sort of fun, the fundamental aspect of that aerosol indirect problem today that we only just gained we learned. That's a cloud water problem. Okay, far reaching shadow cast by three giants. Okay, let's think about this. The first one is Mason himself. Mason, um, Mason visited General Electric sort of just around the time of these uh, experiments being taken post war. And he realized that there's a whole science discipline that needs to be developed. And that was a discipline of cloud physics. And this book of his, The Physics of Clouds, is, was literally the Bible at its time. And I asked, I, I asked uh, Bill Cotton about it, and, they, and he said basically, in his generation of cloud physics, this was the Bible. And Mason's students were many, you know. Mason's students led cloud physics as a science, you know, in the 70s and 80s. So Peter Hobbs, for example, John Latham, uh, John Hallett, Dan Mosser, all these famous names that are famous to us in the 80s were Mason students. So his, his influence was, a, was immense. He also, he also presumably met, met Bird soon because he later became the director of the Met Office for many years and his mission was to enhance weather prediction. He believed satellite observations would be a key to advance weather prediction. So I could never see that, I, I could never find the true convincing evidence that he and Bird soon me overlap, but they clearly did close their contemporaries and they had the same kind of vision with the same mentality of what, what, how satellite observation might play a role. So the next, uh, okay, so so cloud physics as an evolving science. Peter Hobbs wrote a review, and these are his cartoons from that review, published in 18, 1989, and you know, in the 50s, the first half of the 20th century, the 50, up to the 50s or so, clouds were contained in a, in a cloud chamber. There's real clouds out there, but they kind of looked at the microphysical processes. The original idea of cloud seeding was just to simply change the microphysics, and it must change the precipitation. Uh, in the second half, we started to expand our vista and start to look at the cloud scale with aircraft, a little bit with satellites, with radars, and so on. Right? So that was his cartoon. What I'm going to try to illustrate to you, or kind of convince you, or, or not as the case may be, is that cloud physics Evolve, cloud physics has evolved where you think about it from a quantitative understanding and hypothesis testing point of view. Cloud physics um, really was very much in the cloud scale to the mesoscale. Uh, the quantitative information that we got from space was more macroscopic, and that was quantitative up at a very large scale. What I'm going to suggest to you is today we kind of close this gap a bit. We say able to say more quantitative things on this scale, uh, on these processes, but on this scale. I'm going to kind of try to convince you of that. We're not nowhere near what we can do from aircraft and from, uh, you know, situ measurements, but we're kind of closing the gap. And that's kind of what I would argue with here part of that. Okay, the second giant, though, no, needs no introduction in this place, um, is called Bertsumi. And, uh, of course, his PhD was about um, the, re the, en the energy budget of a cornfield, um, as is well documented in, his, in the book on his life. And a person who played an interesting role in the evolution of this, where this is taking, is um, Herbert Real, who founded the Department of Atmospheric Science at CSU, who on his committee had uh, said, well, okay, so you've got the energy budget of a cornfield, what about Earth? And that made, uh, obviously, that would Vernon obviously thought about this, and that led to the radiation budget, early radiation budget measurements. And the obvious that we know today is that the radiation budget, the OLR, patterns of OLR, look like patterns of weather. And so this is, in some ways, you can think that this is like the birth of satellite meteorology as we kind of think of, think of it today. So there we see the impact of a, of, a, of a very influential person for many decades in shaping the direction of the satellite object. Mason of the cloud physics mentality, how we think about cloud physics. The third person 
is Sean Toomey. The, the Sean Toomey among anyone I can imagine in the field is, is, the, is the quintessential definition of a polymath. This person made major contributions across, across many areas. He has inversion theory, um, he, has, he has inversion theory and, and um, inverse modeling um, theories named after him. He has the so-called Toomey effect that everyone knows about. Um, he has he has, of course, did some very elementary work in cloud nucleation in the laboratory. So this guy was a complete polymath and one of the real, one of the real major influences in our science, but doesn't get as much recognition as the others probably. He wrote a, now we, we, we currently retrieve properties of cloud from space today and we call this Nakajima King and that's kind of a misnomer really because Toomey, Toomey and Seaton in 1980 really developed a, Toomey in the 60s actually developed this, in 80 they sort of developed an approach to get information that we now call Nakajima King, but it's Toomey and it's Toomey's fingerprints all over this. Um, uh, and then of course with the, with the fires uh, bringing particles into the clouds and changing the albedo clouds, we now have this effect, the effect we know as Toomey effect and uh, for sure Toomey. So this person, his influence was was enormous and continues today, even though he passed away in 2012. So they're the three giants in the field, um, forcing all feedback. So we had this meeting in Toulouse, and we had lots of wine at the dinner, and everyone was up <laughs> dancing around, jigging around, and so forth. So the question we were asking the next day, in a, in a, in a sort of a hungover state, was, was, was this a state of forcing or feedback? And of course it's both. And the aerosol indirect effect is sort of by forcing or feedback, it's kind of both forcing and feedback. So, okay, so let's get to the cloud, let me get now to the step towards cloud physics and the drive to try to understand on a much larger scale. And this comes back to the idea of cloud physics and cloud radio cloud feedback problem. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion going on about the cloud feedback problem, what, and how, what role will observations play, and what sort of observations do we need, and so on and so forth. And uh, we've had some heated debate of this in the last couple of years, actually, as we start to move towards the next generation of global observations to try to advance this problem. So imagine you force the climate system and then perturbs the energy budget, which in turn changes the system itself, the cloud, which um, then feeds back on the radiation budget, and the final output through the feedback is the climate change, the change of climate zone, right? And so, and so, if you think about this as a loop, like this sort of simple, given radiation, what a cloud, given cloud, what a radiation, two sort of basic questions that represent this loop. And you can think about historically, much of the decade of the 70s and 80s, focus on this part of the loop. It's all about, if you have a cloud, what's it doing the radiation, and can we cut the radiation, the albedo cloud, and all that kind of stuff. Um, this, is, this is actually the easy part of the problem. It's a part of the problem that so I was heavily involved in. I'm just saying it's the easy part of the problem because I did it, I involved in it. But, uh, um, uh, but we have lots of tools today, and some think that's all we've got to do is continually measure the radiation out here, and that's enough to understand the loop. It's clear, clearly, it's not enough. It just tells you the net effect. You've got no idea. You've got really no. Just measuring this part of the loop gives you no idea about this part of the loop, which turns out to be where the real challenge is and where the challenge has been for decades. And we recognise we knew this decades ago this was a challenge. We just didn't have an idea how to address it. And we still fumble with this today, really. Um, so 70s and 80s actually more, been, more even to the recent times, uh, 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 the 70s and 80s followed by, by the activities of the recent times where we focus shifted on how radiation and the climate environment shapes the clouds. This is the so-called cloud parameterization or prediction problem. This is the challenge is given some change in environment, what the hell happened to the cloud and cloud system, convection, precipitation, and so on, um, given, as driven by some change in the environment itself, radiation budget, or the environment itself. Uh, this is a hard part of the pro problem, and it intimately engages cloud physics and cloud physics processes to try to get more quantitative about closing this part of the world, ultimately understand more feedback. That's in my view, by the way, so um, we can debate this. We still have, a view that all you have to do is measure the radiation budget at the top of the atmosphere and even an deny them, and you've got the whole feedback problem solved. I, mean, I don't see that as the case at all. So, whether you believe it or not, regardless of your viewpoint, the need for more advanced types of observational data that give a large scale perspective of radiation, cloud, radiation and cloud physics and the process that couple them, it was clear that we needed this. And this is sort of, in most respects, the motivation for our CloudSat. 
uh, recognise we need to sort of make small steps along this path in order to start to bring some better understanding of the entire field. And we're still struggling today, you know, we still haven't really wrapped our mind around this problem today. Two important relationships emerged from the satellite point of view from the least from the point of warm clouds. One was one that I created, I did in back in 78, it's basically the least optical depth of liquid water part and particle size, I mean bulk particle size. It connected cloud physical properties, such as liquid water path, to the radiative properties, the optical depth, um, directly. It was kind of a in your face direct statement of this is how cloud physics and radiation couple. Um, several cloud feedback studies appeared in the literature in the 80s were to bounce around the feedback on liquid water path and ice water path for that matter, uh, and the relationship between temperature and these water quantities, and that was a feedback concept that flowed around. It provided a later basis for remote sensing liquid water path from optical measurements. It related to defective radius as a cloud property and as a tool to examine aerosol indirect effects. Uh, a debate that took me 20 years or 30 years, 20 some years or 30 years to figure out is what the heck does this mean? And in the early days, in the 80s, a cloud physicist said, this is, this, you shouldn't call it effective radius, guys, you should call it ineffective radius, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and so I'm going to argue that, and I sort of believe that, but I'm going to argue that my view has changed. I actually think it does have inferences about cloud physics anyway. It elevated effect, okay, it gave a rationale for the nascent microwave method, methods that were developing just prior to this by Stalin and Al. They, they contacted me when I wrote this paper and said, hey, listen, we, can, we think we can derive this liquid water path from the microwave observations from space. This, this could be important because you've just shown you this size of radiation. So we started a dialogue back then. But it, it's sort of, the sort of a dialogue going on why the liquid water path might become important. Um, the other important relationship was tubing, which related the optical depth to number concentration, depth of the cloud and some, some airy way to particle size. Uh, this brought a much more direct focus and connection to that cloud number con drop concentration to optical depth. And of course that's one of the important books for really digging into the aerosol indirect. So th th these are two ways of thinking about what the optical depth of the cloud is. Um, it serves as a base for retrievals of cloud number concentration. There's a whole in, uh, cottage industry trying to retrieve the cloud number concentration. But in order to do so, you've got to make fairly gross assumptions about this particle size and depth of the cloud in order to kind of do the current day retrievals. I'm going to skip over that. So let's, um, let's go to the cloud physics from space, the early era, what I call the early era. Um, so there are two, kind of from a warm cloud perspective, two like main methodologies that emerged. One was the passive microwave or a hint of that, where you would measure the emission from microwave over an ocean surface. The land surface is so more variable, so it's difficult to do over land. Um, and warmer, radiometrically warmer, so you can't see contrast. And you measure it over cloud or over rain, or even more, you can think this is also water vapor. And that differential in emission relates to the amount of water vapor, the cloud of the water, and the precipitation in the column. So that's sort of the simple physical basis for it. The other was the Tumi method, the Tumi method, which is a bispectral method where you measure one wavelength in the visible, one wavelength in the near infrared. The wavelength in the visible is related to the optical depth, and the wavelength in the infrared is related to the particles, the near infrared particle size, the um, reflectivity in the near infrared is a function of optical depth and particle size through the, this is the red here, through the single scale of the So that, that's how particle <coughs> size and optical depth were the principal retrievable from these two observations from reflected sunlight. Now, this is this is sort of not, it's not mentioned discussing a kind of a whole another industry using infrared methods like um, like um, Paul Menzel, but these were methods that were used to specifically try to go after liquid water clouds and their optical properties that we think were important for characterizing the radiation. Budget. Now, here are some current data sources. This is a 29 year climatology of liquid water path. Uh, this is a result published by El Sassero, but it was, a, it was um, Chris O'Dell, um, the Gulf Bernards were connected to this, I'm sure, I'm sure, Tom, I'm sure you're connected to this somehow or another, you know, um, it's a, it shows the climatology cloud liquid water path, Cl um, uh, uh, June, July, August, uh, January, June, July, August, December, January, and February. This is the liquid water optical, liquid water cloud optical depth from 40 year remotest cloud climatology. This is the liquid water effective radius from the same 40-year motor climatology. 
and sort of come back and sort of, sort of concentrate on this one for a minute. But this is just to show you that we have decades, decades, or a couple of decades, maybe a couple of decades of these kind of properties of low warm clouds that we can now start to look at its relation to the environment with. This is a kind of a real serious issue that kind of ignored and one of my pet peeves in life is the, are the MIP activities under CMIP and the fact that it's, I think it's stifling real development in science and model development and so on. This is just pet peeve, we can debate this over a drink. But look at this as a Taylor diagram. I'm sure you all kind of been calibrating the Taylor diagrams. But anyway, this is this is the Mac Nickel Water Park climatology as a reference. These are 14 cement models up here in Nickel Water Park over a region of Earth where there, we know they're low clouds and it's in large scale large, large scale environments subsiding. So these are large there's a boundary layer, warm clouds, liquid water, and the liquid water path of these clouds is 60% and the mean larger. Than we observe. Now, this bias existed in CMIP 3. This is a CMIP 5, CMIP 3 bias. Same bias. This is pretty serious, guys, because, you know, I mean, low cloud is supposed to be one of the principal factors in, in cloud feedback. How this bias of this type is, is really, you know, you've really got to question what the heck are we using these models for to say something quantitative about low cloud feedback when we have way too few of them, but way too wet, you know? So, I think these sorts of issues we should be developing MIPS around to try to drip biases in the model, not run scenarios where we do you know, just you know, do stuff that I don't think has any scientific shop on. Anyway, that's, that's a hobby horse. I'll skip over. I'll skip, I'll jump, go move on. Okay, liquid water, this is the map I showed you before, the liquid, the effective radius of liquid. This is where I started to realise that this information we retrieve from water clouds, effective radius, this ineffective radius is actually more effective than I'd realised. Okay? So this is just a breakdown of the effective radius land versus ocean. You see the ocean, sort of the median value in the ocean, or the mode value here in the ocean is about 16, 17, 18 microns. Now, you know, anyone knows with cloud physics, and that's pretty damn big for, for cloud droppers. Typically, we see them between 5 to 10 microns. And there's a land that's quite significantly different, it's about 12, 13 microns. So land ocean is all, already very different. You can kind of see it there, which makes a little bit of sense from a cloud physics point of view. But if you look at, this is another rendition of the MODIS product, which is from, uh, taken from a Leo Donna paper. And this is the GFDL model effective radius climatology for warm clouds. And you know, they're just like, they're totally different. And so these particles are more in the realm of, you know, 12, 13 micron cloud top layers versus this is up here at 20 microns up here. So the question is, is this because it's purely an artifact, a retrieval artifact? Or is there something more to it than this? And I'm going to suggest to you that this represents signatures of the cloud physics. In this case, the signatures of drizzle occurring in these clouds. And what you're seeing is a drizzle signature that gets manifested in turn into the how we interpret effective radius. Now this is some still in the community don't believe this. They still think it's kind of all sorts of other reasons, like three-dimensional effects, of not the rate of transfer, the forward modeling and the retrieval thing has got some biases because of three-dimensional effects and so on. I'd just say, with Occam's razor, when you see large particles and you see correlates with the presence of drizzle, you know, that's kind of a simple argument, explanation, right? And you know, you have, you have a pretty tough time convincing me that something more convoluted than that. But you know, I'm not totally dismissive. So, we began to answer these, this, like this conundrum about the effective versus ineffective radius. And we were able to tie we able to get some sort of clarity on it when we started to look, begin to use the observations of the golden era from the A-train. So clouds like Calypso, Aqua, Parasol, Aura, OCL. I'm sure with Tristan being here, he's probably talked about this to a few folks, you'll know about this. So that would be the, <coughs> what the structure of this uh, constellation looks like and the clouds like Calypso and what it does. The clouds are obviously with the millimeter radar is exquisitely sensitive to drizzle, right? Um, so we began to answer many of the questions that we had about the early era observations and we could go further than just cloud properties. We could begin to actually see cloud process. I'm going to try to convince you that. So not just getting properties and just, you know, static fields and stuff. We can now actually see things evolving. Okay, we know A-Train was really big because look, this is the Big Bang Theory. This is the A-Train poster, guys, come on. Now, now which, which science project has 
has appeared in Big Bang Theory. You know, this is pretty cool. So, you know, we arrived with a bang, as I said, right? Um, okay, so let me just start to give you a sense for why I think the effective radius, the ineffective radius is the effective radius, and why I think we can begin to say something about process, right? Now, I'm going to cut, carve, sort of step away through two view graphs here to sort of do this. And this view graph, I keep getting like a vibration here. That's a problem you've got one of these smart, smart phones and emails <laughs> come in, right. texts right. come in, and you turn your phone off and you're still vibrating like crazy right. here. Um, okay, we're going to use microwave. The beauty of the train is we've got all these coincident observations and really, really taught me how the value of these coincident observations to really understand much more quantitative about process that I could I ever imagine. We didn't really imagine this at the time, you know, we weren't that smart, but we kind of, we kind of learned as well. Microwave liquid water path, we have those microwave radiometry gets this liquid water path, we have motors optical depth, we have the layer mean drop size from the combination of these two. It's just if you use the microwave liquid water and the optical depth, you can get a quite a bit different measure of particle size. This is a layer mean average because both of these are layer mean. And, and we have a layer mean reflectivity from the radar. So how this sort of works as follows. We follow this. This is the reflectivity, and this is log of log of particle size, mean particle size. So imagine you've got this in the observable and this is in a quote unquote observable. Then, so you've got sort of population of states in which the liquid water path, liquid water content is sort of constant um, along the line like this as particle size grows and, and Z grows. Um, so liquid water con constant, that means that Z goes as a third power of the particle size. Liquid water constant means a growing Reflectivity occurs through coalescence, the particle swell. Um, and so, um, so the particle swell. On the conversely, this red line is a case of con uh, of coalescence. Conversely, this red line is a case of condensation, where number concentration is constant. Uh, in this case, the particles swell, not the other way around. The particles in, in pa particles uh, coagulate and change the number concentration. Here, the number concentration stays constant. Um, and so Z goes as a six power in this case. And so you'd see relationships like this. And so when you look at the data and screen it by precipitation, which would occur in these cases, you see how the data looks, right? And you can start to see that you've got indices. You can, you can type points, locations, where condensation is a dominant mode versus coalescence is a dominant mode, right? Now, you know, I mean, of course, these are real data and it's not doesn't fall tightly on the line, but you can kind of see it falls on, one falls on the slope of, you know, six and the slope of six and the slope of three, right? So this is a way now of typing what sort of gro drop of growth dominate in clouds, in warm clouds over the planet, right? And here's an example of this. This is, this is a case where we identified this to be cloud, uh, cloud being purely condensational growth, and you can kind of see it's got higher populations along the coastal line where condensation occurs and much lower where we see these clouds and we see the big effective radius, remember, this is kind of the where the big effective radius occurred. The cases where um, it's, um, it's more dominated in this case by uh, the coalescence. It's interesting to note that if you look at the liquid water to total cloud water ratio, this is like the ratio of cloud water to total water, rain and cloud. The ratio of where it's high is on the coastal region sort of co corresponds more or less with this, with this region we call in clouds. So it's sort of a loose, independent sort of uh, uh, interpretation of this data. But anyway, the point is that we think we, we can type how particles are growing, the physics of clouds on a global scale, and we think this is important because we think the aerosol indirect effect cares about what process is the dominant process. So let me go now to the um, a different aspect, the drizzle forming process and why I think the ineffective radius is the effective radius. Imagine this is a simple condensational, I mean a coalescence, you know, model of coalescence, overly simple, but we need to do it in terms of interpret the observations. And basically, if you go through the sort of simple math in this model, you can show that a change in reflectiv radar reflectivity for a change in optical depth is proportional to the collection efficiency. So we have this as a measurable, and this as, quote unquote, a measurable. And so what happens is, and this is from real data, clouds have reflectivity, 
optical depth on this scale. This is particle size of 5 to 10 microns. You've got basically no coalescence uh, taking place, you see. The slope of this is zero, basically. Small particles. You go larger particles, you start to get some coalescence process. Larger still, larger still. This is, to me, if you can't, if you don't believe me, look, just look at the data and show you that, you know, clearly drizzle and rain are forming and it correlates with when particles are large from remote observation. So that's why I call it the effective rate correct. I mean, it took me 20 some years to convince myself this was actually effective. Okay, so, so, so all we have is now we have the observations, less than 10, uh, 10 to 15, 15 to 20 here, right? Effective radius. These are the observed. And these are from um, three different models UK Met Office model, GFDL model, and this is the MRI. Um, Earth system model, and you can see that basically these models produce drizzle regardless of the particle size. And so this is quite serious and becomes aerosol indirect effect, right? Because I will argue that this drizzle process is pretty fundamental to the aerosol indirect problem. And so the effective radius indeed reflects physics, as I said. There is no model drizzle rain sensitivity to particle size. So how can the aerosol influence the rain and the drizzle process when you have no particle size? Okay, so you've really shot, cut, shut down one of the pathways with which aerosol might affect the Okay, let's come full circle, come back to wrap this up shortly in a second. Um, coming full circle, the aerosol indirect problem. So let's think about this. Cloud seeding, hypothesis, modification of microphysics produces a macroscopic effect. That is <laughs> precipitation, right? That's hypothesis. Hypothesis, indirect effect. A modification of microphysics produces a macroscopic albedo effect, albedo. <laughs> same sort of hypothesis, right? Slightly different target, the same sort of hypothesis, right? Two, response under cloud seeding not simply predictable from given microphysical forcing. We learned that, you know, when we went out seeding, you see clouds and things didn't happen the way we expected because we learned the dynamics, as Simpson and Wigget said. That's the dynamics, moving water around, changing things. Response not simply predictable from a given microchemical forcing. Right? <laughs> Third, very few cases to eke out that statistical cause and effect. You just couldn't do it. You can't scientifically sit down there and say we have cause and effect from a handful of fuel programs. You just can't do it. Cloud physics models had issues of assumptions about all representation of microphysical processing models, and you know, one was dubious about them. Required a physical argument based on cloud modeling, but still, even today, there are questions. This is where aerosol indirect effect is potentially different. We have large amounts of correlated data, plus natural, like volcanic eruptions, and anthropogenic phenomena, like ship tracks, are providing clues of cause and effect. So we have, nature's given us a massive number of these fill program examples that cloud, this cloud seeding didn't have. So can we make use of that? Okay. So, for example, this is um, this is um, uh, the satellite data. This is a change in particle size, effective radius for a given change in aerosol optic depth. It's really correlated, you know, given the, given the observed change in aerosol optic depth, the observed change in particle size. What you'll notice, blue everywhere, it's pretty unequivocal that if you change aerosol, correlated with that is a change in cloud droplet particle size decreases. That's 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 a little debate on that. This is the similar for liquid water path for change, given change in aerosol optical depth. And what you see is you get positives and negatives all over the place. Liquid water paths are changing all over the place. This is why I'd say I think it matters what kind of cloud growth, water, what growth modes occurring in clouds um, uh, for aerosol indirect problem. Right? So, so let's just take, this is kind of a quick way, and I've got two more view graphs and wrap up this or something. So, gee whiz, bank stuff. Um, this is the observational, that, that global maps, it's now smooshed into a two-dimensional diagram of change in albedo, of given change in optical depth versus change in particle size of given optical depth. And this is the distribution of points, that global map is distributed now in this space. You can see there, but you've got a whole bunch of points here, and this is a kind of interesting point. These points here are from ship track observations where you would think that you could argue more for cause and effect of ship tracks than you can just with global observation. So what we're saying is that the behavior of these global logs is quite consistent with the cause and effect that we see from ship tracks. 
You see, the particle size is decreasing everywhere. This is just shifted to the to the left of the zero line. And the liquid water part, however, is up and down, positive and negative. It's quite complicated. And this is what makes the aerosol indirect problem complicated. That's why it's not just simply a brightening of clouds. In fact, 30% of these ship tracks produce a darkening of the clouds, a negative albedo of it. So, you know, when these guys pose the seed clouds to brighten the planet, that's geoengineering, what the hell are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> what the hell are they doing? They don't know because they, they don't understand the physics of the problem. This is global models, and the thing about global models is basically they don't have a negative liquid water feedback in any in this process. All this negative feedback we think comes from evaporation, enhanced evaporation cloud top, inducing the liquid water. Models all have a very positive liquid water response, so they have a system that wants to brighten the clouds by reducing the particle size, and wants to brighten the cloud by making them wetter. In nature, this is not so fast, but there's all sorts of things going on in nature. So this is an issue, I'm going to skip over the next one, this is just the same diagram but with volcano data, which is the same thing. Now, wrap up here, now we'll get to June stuff. This is, um, the aerosol indirect effect is intimately tied to warm rain processes, as we say, I keep saying, this is a real clear example of this. This is the A-train data, again in this optical depth reflectivity sort of space. And this is one model, one of the Earth system models, the MIRAC model, with five different um, coalescence schemes in them, including uh, uh, Triple and Cotton and, and Greg, you know, this is not so good this one, but that's okay, it's maybe an old version. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, so the Triple E model, the same format, small particles, moderate sized particles, large particles, no, 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 no drizzle rain, drizzle and rain, the model wants to produce rain all the time with these two schemes. These other schemes, however, start to produce something that looks a little bit more like the observations. Um, and so, and, and then you, so you project these three that look like the observations onto the aerosol indirect forcing derived from this model, so show these experiments, and you get massive aerosol indirect effect of two to three watts per meter squared, minus. And these models have almost none, half a watt indirect effect. So what I'm saying, I'm not saying which one's right or wrong, I'm saying it's extremely sensitive to assumptions about this water producing, water removal process of these low clouds. Okay, let me just tie the threads together and then just close some wings bang on what the future is. We now have multi-decade record of cloud properties that can be usefully tested to model clouds uh, and study variability. We have this large database that's kind of a gold mine. The quantitative gap between microphysics cloud scale to the synoptic scale has closed considerably, uh, this sort of analysis. Um, the global ops we have now can tell us something about major biases. Particle size is derived from reflection measurements, reflects the ubiquitous presence of large drops, so they're not considered effective, not somewhat ineffective. Um, the influence of aerosol on a bit of low clouds occurs through multifaceted processes that can be ultimately tied to the water balance of clouds. Sort of re restating the Simpson and Wigger statement about you know water and the movement of water, change of water. Okay. Last little <laughs> whiz bang. Well, just a little last little whiz bang stuff. Okay. <laughs> what might the future be? This is kind of I know I have to drink the JPL Kool-Aid and be kind of excited about stuff, so bear that in mind. But I think we're in a stage of a new a revolution taking place. Um, and I've written it as a BAMS article, basically except it's in revision. I had one kind of snarky reviewer, but I can handle it, don't worry. <laughs> I got him under control. <laughs> the others love it, so I don't think it's going. Anyway, so this is an example of, of the ESTO program at NASA. And these are some big observatories like Beers, CRIS, ATMS, GPM. Now I'm not saying, uh, one of the points is not true, is that miniaturizing this stuff doesn't mean you have the same performance of fidelity, right? So I'm, I'm not saying that yet, but this is part of the revolution is to demonstrate this. And I, and I, and I think I'll show you that we're getting there, actually. Um, and these are some of the technology developments that have taken place to miniaturize on the CubeSats. Now, I want to make the point clear, I'm not saying CubeSats are the solution, not at all. I'm saying the miniaturization of sensors is the revolution, and the science, of, the Earth science is going to benefit from being able to see Earth with mobile eyes at the same time, but in an affordable way with miniaturized sensors. That's what I'm saying the revolution is. And these are, so we have Swiss, which is a spectrometer, um, uh, you know, CubeSat Swiss, we have Cirrus, which, which, if I did this right, disappeared, it actually was cancelled and then reinstated, and now I'll put money in to, to demonstrate this. 
Uh, the sounding's a little bit more tricky to determine whether a CubeSat sound really will have the same performance as the operational sound because it's shifting in channels and stuff. But Tempest D compared to ATMS, it turns out Tempest D, we have now data in the CubeSat, this is the 3 u 6 u CubeSat, tiny little instrument. It has signal to noise superior by a factor of two over ATMS. It's a 3 u size instrument, two or three million dollar, same performance, better performance. It's really amazing what's going on, I'm telling you folks. And then we have a little toy radar with a little umbrella antenna going pop. And it has a performance at the frequency of PA band for that performance you get. Amazing. A few million dollars. Amazing. Uh, we also have pre-fire. This is the sort of, I don't know what the size of pre-fire is for now, just or not. This, no, is, this, this yeah, is a plastic right. model we made of it, an earlier <laughs> version of pre-fire, which called something else. Um, pretty small little spectrometer with lots of capability. Um, um, to, uh, I don't know whether this is the right data, I just bring that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, really 23. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> it's lucky, isn't it? Um, we have now a backscatter LiDAR of a 50 centimeter cube. Uh, it doesn't have the same performance of like Calypso, but you know these things are becoming miniaturized. I'm telling you folks, they're becoming miniaturized at a, at a, at a rapid rate. And CubeSat to some degree played a part because they define the volume, power, weight, envelope in which to fit these things. And so it's given the sense of people the targets to try to build to. And that's sort of an important thing, I would argue anyway. Okay, check this out. This is Rain, Cube and Tempest coming out space station. Spew out. Here's a six year spacecraft. And so you can see them starting to separate. And then they spin off and do their thing, right? That's pretty cool, I think. I'm going to try and talk bands into doing screen captures of that for the front cover. I don't know whether they'll buy them. So you can start to see it spin out. And this is the rain cube in the lab, six years, like by that size. This is a body spacecraft and radar whole thing. So it's a fair to say these miniaturized things that are happening, kind of exciting, but can they actually produce and perform like the, the, their bigger counterparts? I would have told you that Tempest does. I don't really have an example, but look, look at this. This is rain cube, KA band, have the same storm, GPM, KA band. Now, these are a little bit apples and oranges because the KA, GPM is a swath instrument, and this is not a swath instrument, but come on, this is a tiny little toy thing with half a meter global antenna. And so this is where the future is. We're going to see these active instruments miniaturized like this. This is a glimpse of what the future could be. It happens to be serendipitous. This is ATMS. Brightness temperatures at different frequencies, sort of put on a plane so you can kind of see the AP8, you can kind of see the vertical st structure would be implied in the different channels. These are Cygnus winds over tropical typhoon Trami. These are Cygnus surface winds, and this is the rain from the um, rain cube. So this is all cu this is CubeSats and Cygnus and SmallSats. We have an observing system. You can imagine looking at storms through this integrated way. This is really, truly affordable. This is within reach to be um, really low cost. Um, we can imagine doing these things in constellation where we can fly these things seconds apart to look at convection evolving and unfolding, which is what we have proposals for. So I'm going to skip over that. And then the last biograph is the coming decade. The coming, coming decade, some of you probably know about the decadal survey that was conducted by the Academy, where they identified um, five main designated observables and a number of key other key measurement types. Within the designated observables is the aerosol cloud convection precipitation um, um, activity, which is currently under design now, is basically rebuilding the atrium, which way I would propose it. And uh, this is kind of exciting because it puts this fairly on the radar screen, no pun intended, for the next decade for the sciences and for funding from NASA in this area, uh, particularly convection, which has not really been on the radar screen as much um, with NASA. So it's kind of going to be an exciting time, I hope, for the atmospheric sciences um, through this NASA program, because there's all the other programs that, um, that, um, that um, also add and add to it. And, um, um, so anyway, that's the sort of the future of where we are, and that's kind of it. I know it's kind of long, so I warned you it was a little bit long, but um, you know, that's some jingle stuff in it. Okay, thank you.
I'm the MC, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you critique the CMIP programs, and I'm wondering what you think we should, I mean, clearly people are interested in what's going to happen with yeah. climate change, so what do you think we should be okay, doing so instead to uh, well, we, well, I try and figure out what's going to happen I mean, some of these are, uh, are needed. I think MIPS are needed, but I, don't, I think primarily we should invest uh, energy in trying to address the major glaring biases in models. Just ignore it. You know, and I showed you, you one. Well, you could do MIPS. You could do MIPS that focus on the processes by which low clouds form and not in the model and just start to type observations and so on. So make a conservative MIP about it. And so improving the models. Yeah, improving the models to address biases specifically. And they don't really do that. There isn't really, I mean, Wigney does a little bit of this, but you know, we'll take, let's determine what the real weaknesses of the models up models are and let's see if we can't address them. That would be number one. That would be, I would think, the principal goal of MIPS would be that, right? Then you can do some, you definitely need to do some scenario experiments, but the problem is the MIPS now are just a suite of all of these experiments, many, many of which don't make that much sense, and all of the resources are taken up doing it. And the resources aren't devoted to actually improving the improving models. models. Yeah. So I would have that as a principal goal and do these other things secondarily, not the other way around. That's what I would do anyway, but I'm not, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, your glass ceiling brings back memory of uh, northeast Brazil. Yeah. A rainy season centered around April. Yeah. Most abundance in years when the intertropical conversion zone moves farther south. Yeah. Well, in contrast to that, yeah. in the past century, yeah. the Brazilian administration financed <coughs> an abundant fleet of aircraft yeah. just for cloud ceiling. Yeah. And it took a while for them to realize the that. The Chinese have done a lot too. I mean, I'll never forget because I was brought up in the time of the 70s where cloud seeding, no. in the 50s and 60s, 50s and 60s, cloud seeding was a big deal in Australia and the cloud physics division in also Australia. Australia too. Yeah, cloud no. physics division in Australia was all about case. And Toomey was there and, you know, um, Jack Warner and the other players. And I never get Jack Warner gave this seminar in the 70s, early 70s. <laughs> and he said that basically his conclusion was. Yes, we can show statistically there's marginal improvement in, in precipitation in this area where we have abundant precipitation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so that always stuck with me. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Now, Graham, related to, great talk, related to Larissa's question, are we certain we know where it drizzles on the Earth? Yeah. And the second question related to that, do any of those places that are character characterized by drizzle undergo intra-annual variability, where it's drizzling one year and it's precipitating another year in a more, more, yeah, okay. more intense way. Okay, so um, we did this study in a published QJ about a year ago. This is a sort of sort of around that answer the question. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, I wrote a press thing for it, but JPL threw it away because he didn't like it. It's called the rain in space hardly stays on the brain. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that, you know. Basically what we find, if you go back to this sort of nice way that uh, Suzuki and his colleagues have developed this relationship between Z and the um, radar effective <coughs> optical depth, you can't see the drizzle process. If you look at over land versus over ocean, they're actually quite different. Over land, when it drizzles over land, it doesn't drizzle. Clouds don't drizzle over land, they go from cloud to rain. Over ocean, it goes through this phase of, you know, really light, a lot of light drizzling stuff and then goes into rain. So there's no drizzle mode, it just goes. So it doesn't occur as often, but when it does, it just goes into rain. Right, so there's a little bit of a difference in assume. We think we think the reason for that is over land there's a, there's more more dynamics, more up to, up to, up to are stronger and there's a shallow convection over land than there's over ocean. And we think that plays a role in holding the particles up to get to a larger size of rain out. Right, so we get some insight there. Doesn't really answer the interannual variability though, you know, this database that we have is you know, this this is the or with like cloud samples happen six or seven years before it had the other daylight mode. Well, how are we going to do in the interim? We're going to go in a different mode, part of the decade of observation. So, you might make Tristan might have some comments on that, but you know, my mentality has been just for looking at the processes and trying to understand how it works in nature before I worry about its variability. But it could be looked at, yeah. but you'd have to do it cleverly in some way to stitch the data record together that's pretty homogeneous. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't have the energy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But someone could do it, right? Just someone probably has done it. Yeah. Hey, Grant, thanks. Yeah. That was a great talk. Um, so in terms of these biases that we're yeah. finding in the CMIT models, 
Yeah. What's your sense? Would that increase or decrease climate sensitivity? Do you have any idea of the sign? Um, I think it would. <laughs> I think, yeah, that's almost the point. Someone says crap, you know, about back there. Um, and, and, um, I think it will decrease it for the following reason, okay? Um, I won't go back. The following reason. If you look at the low cloud optical depth that we see, like observations, and we skip policy, but I didn't believe you all, because I didn't believe you all for three years. But the low cloud optical depths are about five to six in the mean. That's pretty optically thin. If you look at the cloud the optical depth in models, it's probably 30, 40. It's at least 20. The problem there is, if you look at how the albedo responds to optical depth change, it's sort of a linear dependence when the optical depth is low, and it's, and it's no dependence when it's high. So you have not got a liquid water feedback in the models by construction because liquid water passes too high. So I think there's a negative feedback there that's not in the model by, through this bias. Is it important? Is it a big factor? I don't know, but you can't use the current model to say it doesn't exist because you're in a space where by construction it doesn't exist. And I'll never forget this, should, I should take, say something bad about Ralph, because I know he's a close colleague, I don't even know, I don't know where he is anymore, because either sometimes he's here and sometimes he's there and sometimes he's elsewhere, but um, sometimes he's vibrating again. But um, I never forget when I was proposing that this ineffective race and effective race is really an indicator of drizzle. And, and then on the response back, there's no way you can see drizzle uh, with these measurements of reflection of uh, 2.1 micron. You can't see it. I said, well, how do you know? Well, we've done these LES simulations. It shows it. Oh, I say. Well, can I study this get the details? OK, it's in this paper. It's in this paper. Ralph said, right. They've got this from Platnik and the whole Motors Marvel, you know? Because, you know, I mean, I don't necessarily think they could eat. OK, he sends the paper. What do I find? Well, the LES simulation, liquid water parts 400. What we see over the oceans and Earth is 60. Well, shit, this is like, this is like a mirror. <laughs> you know? yeah. Of course you're not going to see it. You've got the totally wrong type of cloud, nothing on Earth. So this is the sort of thing, just because someone says it, it doesn't mean it's... That was, that was my one advice for my, my mentor, Garth Pop, which you, you mentioned. He told me from day one as a young PhD student, don't believe anything, any shit, don't believe any bloody thing <laughs> read in the literature. And I sort of take that true because if I believe that, yeah. I wouldn't dig further and so say, this doesn't make sense because it doesn't match the observations that which are optical that five and partly four and half sixty. You know? Because they did this earlier simulation, they've got a cloud that's completely opaque. Anyway. So I don't <coughs> was that an answer to your question? Yeah. It's, it's 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 a it's a sobering answer though. <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> I think there are feedbacks. I also think there are negative feedbacks of high clouds. You know, right now the community is saying high cloud feedbacks are all positive. You know, in fact, guess what? We find nature has modes of variability, interannual variability, and so related, but video variability related, where the whole troposphere swells, breathes up and down. As the troposphere breathes up, comes up, and the convection deepens, the high clouds get really thick and much brighter and reflect much more solar, and that drives their energy budget. Not the high cloud change, not the long wave changes. So there's potential for negative feedback. We don't know the feedback; they're just changes. But I don't believe that the majority, like IPCC stated, you know, and I dis disagree with this. They made a statement: all feedbacks in the climate, cloud feedback to climate system are positive. They said that originally. I said no way. I can't, I'm not going to sign up on that. Mm -hmm. They said all feedbacks we know of are positive, and I couldn't fight that because my more intuition than. But, you know, I believe that we have these negative feedbacks that could exist. Do I mean, does that mean they're going to risk climate warming? No. But there are cloud feedbacks that I believe are very, very much negative. Right? Yeah, okay. Do you see the same type of biases in the higher resolution global models? Uh, when you start yeah. getting, like, sub-10 kilometers? Yeah, we did a study back, Kenna did a study back in the late 2010, and we used um, RAMs and a few other CRMs, and they still had a bias. Um, MMF had a bias, but it's not really bad. Uh, it's still a kind of a little bit of an open question mark, actually. How, what kind of resolution of cloud physics would you need to address this? Yeah. I think they're also still well, using bulk microphysics. They're not really me, 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 the global stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, so the Rams model was too mode moment, but it still had a bias. I mean, uh, the knob by which you turn drizzle on and off in the models is really empirical. The knob by which you turn the train and deep convection off is empirical. 
And these had massive influences on climate sensitivity. So, anyway. Right, I think that's a great note to end on for uh, the students here. Just remember that message. Don't read. What was it? Don't believe every any don't, bloody thing. Don't, any don't, bloody don't thing you read. Believe any bloody thing. So any of my papers, don't believe it. <laughs> don't believe <laughs> it. All right. Thanks. Let's thank Aaron for coming.